that I've made mine like the original because I think that you can't, you can't beat it. This is Malcolm Wilde. Malcolm's a clockmaker, but he's probably best known for his book Wheel and Pinion Cutting in Horology. Malcolm's been awarded the British Horological Institute's prestigious Barrett Silver Medal. Malcolm's also well known for his specialist clockmaker's tools, manufactured in Sheffield in the north of England. Let's meet him here with Robert Looms, another English clock and watchmaker, and hear about Malcolm's experiences. Malcolm Wilde, I'm here today because you've received the BHI Silver Medal. Your career is so broad in terms of clockmaking, toolmaking, having written one of the best-selling books in horology textbooks. Um, you've had a busy career. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Well, it's all started uh, with engineering. I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, at 15 years old, left school, and I went to apprenticeship, and nobody wanted apprentices, you know, and they said, oh, they just leave. And one of the, the manager, he, he took a liking to me, and then uh, I went to the tool room, Eventually went to the drawing office, and the way that I got interested in horology was the fact that the managing director was a frightening man, but he liked me because I was keen. And when he moved house, he gave me two big boxes of model engineering magazines, and in it was Claude Reed writing his articles, and this is what got me interested in horology, you know, and it just went on from there. I started, I was in charge of the drawing office, and all sorts of different parts in, in engineering, light engineering, uh, inspection, production, all sorts of things. And then in 77, uh, I left to start my own business. I left actually because I had a bit of a deal with the boss and my wife stuck. She said, stick to your guns, you want to work on your own. And uh, I started, I mean, I was an office person really, and I went in working on a machine sort of eight and ten hours a day, which was really, really difficult. You know, I got the, got the workshop and got the equipment and then just it gradually went on from there. You know. So what was the first work that you were doing then when you started on your own? Well, just machining. Uh, they were mainly, because I worked for a hydraulics company and I used to get work from Dunlop and they were like small components in a lot of stainless, horrible stainless steel machining. And then I did some development work you know, for people, and then I got to the point where in sort of after 10 years, I got fed up with people because they knew I worked from home. They give me a job on Friday and they wanted it Monday morning. And so I pushed towards the tools, you see. Yeah. And the first depth in took, the reason I made the made the depth job because I was trying to um, actually uh, find a depth in tool and there were no, none made at all. Um, and I just, I don't know why, because I just like the look of it, you know, I just thought this was a fabulous tool, and the first ones were terrible. I mean, I made them in aluminium, and I put you know, steel runners in, and I had it cast in place, and oh, they, they were shocking things. Gradually, I developed the system. Uh, I think the first one I made was in 77, and uh, it was uh, 75 pounds, and then... Um, a clock maker at Derby, who still reminds me, I bought the, it pestered and pestered my life to get this off me. And then it was, it was the only one that we got. Anyway, we bought it and he still tells me now, it's a really good clock store actually. So that's how I started. Then I developed more of the tools, you know. Because I know that was the first thing that I had of yours, yeah. was your depthing tool. Yeah. Um, I got maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Mm. And we use it every week at work yeah. for something. Mm -hmm. um, well, I make the two sizes now, the French top size and, and the standard one. And my nephew, who works from my train, he's a really good restorer. Um, he says that we've made nine, nine a thousand of the big ones. I'm not so sure, but not the far off that. Yeah. Because I think the largest batch we made about 15, 20 years ago was 65. It's a big batch. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and it takes probably nine months to make a batch, and like it's 20, but all the operations, you know, waiting for people to do the different operations, and me doing my work, you know, the finishing, the setting up, yeah. which is really, really difficult. And uh, they say, as I say, we said to you before, the, the, the tonnage that must have gone out of that small 
shit, 20 by 8 is just amazing, yeah. you know, in 40, yes. 50, 40, 50 years, whatever it was, you know. Yeah. But basically, how it all started, you know. Yeah. Mm. When did you start working on the book on wheel and pinion cutting? Well, I wrote an article in the Model Engineer. Um, I think it must have been around the 80s. And I was friendly. Um, I, must remember, I got to know Philip Thornton, who made the putters. They were carbon steel putters, and they were they were three pound fifty each, which was a lot of money then. And I went to see him, and he gave what well, he told me different formulas, you know, this sort of thing. And I thought there was nothing really written, so I started really studying it more, and I wrote this article in the Model Engineer. Then they printed it into a small book, right, and. Um, it was popular, and then it was pirated in the States, you know. Um, and I, it really annoyed me, this. But Jill Hatfield, book dealer, she said, look, why don't you rewrite it? Why don't you make, you know, sort of a really... And so I started researching it. It's now 20 years, I think it was... I think it was uh, 20 years ago, but it took me three years. Yeah. Three, so three years' work, and taking the photographs, you know... And the formula out and everything. And my nephew, who is not so good on maths, he said, You know, I want it so that this is the formula, so I wasn't bad at maths, so transpose all the formulas so that you could just slot things in using the calculator, you know, and that was it. I think so, that's one of the things that mm -hmm. probably people like about the book so much mm -hmm. is um, it's it was like a new generation of books mm -hmm. because the older textbooks that you read. Mm -hmm. There are very few drawings, hardly ever a photograph, yeah. um, mm. and a lot of dry mathematics on mm. how to do the calculations. Yeah. Mm. And when I opened your book, mm. and it's full of photographs mm. and drawings, yeah. and it explains things in very simple steps. Mm. For yeah, I mean, I have the advantage because of the draftsman, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I can't do CAD, but I can draw and I can design things and that sort of thing. And although well, it's important, you know, to try and show things and a lot of the setups are ones that I did to yes. show people that it can be done, you know, and I think that's that's important, you know, to yeah. show it's not being done. Because like in a lot of books, like say to Archie Perkins, a fantastic book, in America he's a fantastic guy he was. But they're just the drawings, you know, just a drawing there and whether he did all that I don't know. Whether there's just too much to do. But I mean, sure, they have to do it, but I've actually shown actually being done, which I think is important. Yes. Yeah. You've made a lot of stuff over the years. Yeah, I mean, some of the tools, like the Depton tool, was obviously a replica of made 150 years ago, but lots of the other things that I designed myself, you know. And, um, like, the pivoting tool came between, obviously, but, uh, I mean, there's the uh, finger plate clamp, um, well, milling spindle, microscope, uh, century school, you know, all sorts of things like that. I mean, it's about 20 different tools, you know. Yeah. Some of them, uh, poor sellers, like the polishing tool, which, uh, I bought one back about six, nine months ago now. It's never, ever been used. Wow. And this guy in Switzerland who is mad on my tools, which is surprising, this is, you know, because Swiss, <laughs> they don't think they can make anything. And, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's over the moon, he used it for lapping his gravers and yeah. this sort of thing, you know. But we only made 20, uh, 20 25 of those. Yeah. Never made any more because it's so complicated tool and it was limited. I get asked for it, you know. Yeah. But these tools are, there's often nowhere else to go to get an alternative. Often the tools that you've made are the only ones that are that size and scale. Yeah. Everything yeah. else is either too mm. big or yeah. too small for the job. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only person will making this stuff, really. There's nobody... I mean, Bergeon makes some things, you know, but not exactly the same as I do, you know. Yeah. Bergeon stuff is really, really expensive anyway, but... Um, no, it's been okay. I mean, I'm always thinking of things to make and do, and one thing. I keep saying I won't do anything else. But <laughs> so once you've got these depth thing tools finished, have you got anything else in mind? Well, I'm on with 20 staking tools. I've already got three or four orders for those. I'm on with, I'm thinking about another project to make a clock, you know, 
Yeah, I've got some ideas. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to into that at the moment. But, uh, okay. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed mm. is that all your tools can be beautifully packaged. Yeah, well, they're all in nice purpose-made boxes. Yeah. Yeah, I like presentation and like things to be right. Because you know, Sheffield is cutlery, or was cutlery steel, uh, there were a number of manufacturers making boxes, cutlery case boxes. And probably in the 70s, when I started looking around, there must have been four or five box makers. And um, he used to go to Sheffield Cutlery Case, and they started making them, and then they were originally in black, black boxes. And I just saw one day that they got this red paper, and uh, I said, oh, what about that? Because it's similar to the old tools. Yeah. And uh, so he said, no problem. So we, you know, they're all, you know, as I say, they're all lined. And again, it's becoming difficult now because uh, the guy who worked at Cutler Case, he, he's working only part-time, so they made the lady redundant, who did all the lining. She comes back, but it's getting difficult now. But the, I mean, I've got a lot of boxes in stock about to get them because I don't know how much longer it's going to go. But we ran out of paper. I bought all the paper that was available, and I searched the internet, and then I found another which was very, very similar, and it took a lot, a lot of doing, you know. But uh, no, I like the presentation. Yeah, you know, I like things to look nice, you know, like finished off and that. So you could have designed them, and that was it, you know. Yeah. But it's, it's been interesting, and, you know, I like, I like new projects, I like designing and that sort of thing, you know, it gives me satisfaction. And like making, as I say, I have lots of the bits made out, but we finish them off, my neighbour else, we make a few of but I do a hell of a lot of the work myself, you know. You yeah, said that you think. started when you first got into engineering, reading the Model Engineer yeah. magazines. Yeah. And Claude Reeves' drawings for regulator clocks. Yeah. And so was that the first kind of clock that you got into making? The first one was the one behind you there, that skeleton clock. That was the first one I made. And um, then I designed a lantern clock, which I wrote an article, a series of articles in the model engineer in the 70s, 70, 70, I don't know. And he used to sell all the bits and pieces for it, but people, a lot of people have made it all over the world. Mine took in the lot, won't really sort it out at the moment, but, um, so then I made a series of skeleton clocks, made six, just time pieces. And I sold many to friends, not about 20 years ago. And then, um, I made the regulator because that was based on Claude Reeves' design, but I've updated jewel it and done all sorts of other things. And I made that in conjunction with a friend in New York, a uh, surgeon. Then I got involved uh, with Bob Bray at Sinclair Harding. About five or six years ago, I went to see him about some who were friendly and this sort of thing. And then he said, well, what about making this clock? You know, let's do it together. And... Uh, so I thought well, that's a good idea because I thought I'm getting too old now to make it on my own. And so we worked together. And then my payment was a prototype, but uh, I got the basic. Well, there were so many things that really wanted altering and doing. And, and so that's what I've done. And so you cannot improve on the designs of these clock makers because they were evolved. Like yes. I say, like nib. Long case clock, the proportions are simple and they're absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Same with that conlift. I've made mine like the original because I think that you can't, you can't beat it. You know, you cannot improve on it. And uh, so I've done all sorts of modifications, alterations, and you know, I'm really pleased with it. But I, I probably wouldn't have managed to do it on my own at late in life because it's really complex clock. You know, it's a lot of work in it. You know. I know making something new is very demanding and time consuming because... The thing is, that it's the finishing yeah. is the thing. You can make something and it can take you twice as long to finish it, yeah. to get the finishes correct and that sort of thing. I mean, with the finishing, finishing takes a lot of time. It's like with the detection tools. I mean, my nephew was really, really good. He makes a beautiful job of the finishing on these, in the casting, which is a hell of a job. They have an hour to work, you know. 
and uh, he, he, you know the, the best. I mean, the, the last one was the small ones we made that, you, that uh, Justin had. Um, they were they were our best ever with the small ones. They really were, you know. That's yeah. nice to know you're improving. <laughs> <laughs> I find fascinating about watching clock making is the number of people I meet who run incredibly professional businesses in a relatively small scale. You, you've got your business in a shed and you know, in a spare room and um, crammed into a domestic setting. But what I see when I look round is razor sharp, you know, the equal of any workshop I've been through in terms of precision and ability. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing what you can do in small space. I mean, um, you know, but like in the with everything in the outside which it's clamped and everything, you couldn't move anything around to get any better space and we just utilize the space and I mean people say to me, Why don't you build a bigger workshop? Well, it's, it's not necessary, you know, I can manage and I will spend my time up in the loft because it's more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> people say, How long can you go on? I said, Well, the longer I can I said, I just hope I fall off the end of the bench and that's me doing it. <laughs> Just thrive on on making things, you know. As I said, that's it. Before, when I used to make anything new, and I used to bring it in, my wife who was really fantastic behind me, you know. And uh, she I used to say, What do you think of this? She said, It's lovely, but will you make me one? <laughs> <laughs> Sarcastic, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been, you know, I've been a member of the British Horological Institute for probably 50 years, 45, 40, 50 years, I think now. And I've enjoyed it, and I've tried to support them, you know. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to get the, the silver medal. It's fantastic. I really am pleased, you know. It's a bit of my wife not to tell you, you know. But no, it's been fantastic, and I've enjoyed going to the BHI, the headquarters, and I enjoyed the uh, friendship with Jane, who I really get on with, and I see her from time to time, you know. And uh, she's a smashing girl as well, you know. It's been fabulous. Because I think that you epitomise what the BHI is about in some ways. Mm-hmm. It was formed for maintaining education and standards mm-hmm. in clock and watchmaking yeah. and you've certainly contributed to that mm-hmm. all your working life as far as I can yeah. tell. Um, no, I've, I've been I've really enjoyed and enjoyed that part of my life. I really well, have. You know, I think you are mm-hmm. an outstanding ambassador mm-hmm. for the Institute mm-hmm. and you really represent the best of what it stands for. Well, thank you Robert, thank you. Yeah. Mm. It's really good to talk to you, and I have to say, mm. you are truly deserving of the silver medal. Thank you. I'm um, very pleased anyway, it's a great honour, it really is, you know. Well, I think you've given such a contribution, not just in the tools you've made, mm. not just in the book wheel and pinion cutting, but so many articles of yours, mm. so many people I know that you've helped one way or another mm. in their working mm. lives. Thank you, man. A lot of people are very grateful for what you've done. Yeah, thank you.